dog, it's lonely. You gotta show me the city. Well, better stay house where I'm. Well, since we looked at Factor 5's Rogue Squadron released in 1998, it only made sense to me that we should move on to their spiritual successor and Phantom Menace tie-in. Today we're pulling Star Wars Episode 1 Battle for Naboo off the Retro Room shelf. Released in December of the year 2000 for the N64, and later in March for the PC as well, this Episode 1 tie-in is a pretty interesting one. There are several really good tie-in games for Episode 1, one of which we've looked at already in the form of Star Wars Starfighter, a game that's actually kind of similar to this one in a few ways, which we'll get to. And this was actually the second game to be officially titled with the Episode 1 moniker, the first being Star Wars Episode 1 Racer, a game I'll be covering very soon, but there were several others as well. But what makes this one stand out from the other Episode 1 tie-ins is that it's the only one to attempt a mix of both land vehicle, sea vehicle, and air vehicle missions. That's right, Factor 5 decided to try and expand on potential mission variety by including both land and sea vehicles for this one, which was probably a smart gambit considering the entire game is set on Naboo. Which is another thing that separates this game from its sibling tie-ins, as it's the only one to be set entirely on Naboo with no other locations ever appearing outside of bonus missions. A far cry from its spiritual predecessor, Rogue Squadron, which featured over a dozen different planets across its main campaign. I'll be comparing Battle for Naboo to Rogue Squadron pretty much the whole time. I mean, this game feels more like an expansion pack to Rogue Squadron than a legitimate sequel, honestly, which is why I feel like I'll have to compare. If you haven't watched my Rogue Squadron video, I'd recommend checking that one out before or after you finish this to add some context to where I'm coming from. Now, I always like to have a section early on in these videos about if I have any experience with the game I'm talking about prior to my playing it to cover it here. And something I'll say is, I didn't know that I did until I played it. When I decided to cover it, I genuinely didn't think I really knew anything about it beyond the title and concept. I don't remember when I played it, and I'm nearly positive I did not ever own it. But upon starting up that first mission, I knew I'd seen it before. I don't remember when or where, but I know that at some point in my childhood I have played this game. I have to tell you, it's a very odd sensation to have a memory triggered that you can't place at all. I recognize the opening level, but don't know when or where from. Aside from that, however, I was really going in blind. Now, believe it or not, after doing some research, this game actually does a lot to both add to and stay faithful to the movie and its canon. Throughout the game, we play as Gavin Sykes, which is spelled like a 2008 MySpace screamo artist. Gavin is a lieutenant of the Royal Naboo Security Force, much like Riz Dallos from Star Wars Starfighter. Unlike Riz, however, Gavin actually plays a substantial role in other Star Wars media. Well, the Legends media, not so much the Disney media, because they threw away thousands of hours of people's work and passion from across multiple decades to replace it with their own canon. But back in the Legends media, we can see just how prominent our boy Gavin was. Not only was he actually in The Phantom Menace, but he also shows up in Galactic Battlegrounds, Star Wars Galaxies, and even the aforementioned Star Wars Starfighter, mentioned only as Bravo 6 though. His role is probably the most interesting in Galaxies, where he played a prominent role during the Galactic Civil War, even helping to stop a deadly bioweapon from being released and killing millions. Here, however, we see his humble origins as a young hotshot thrust into the throes of a droid invasion. Just like in Rogue Squadron, Factor 5 and LucasArts have teamed up to give us a wholly original story that coincides with the movie directly. And while it's a little less complicated than Rogue Squadron, I feel it has a lot to add to your enjoyment of the movie. Starting off, we assume control of Gavin during the fall of Theed, playing as we escape the occupation with our ally, Captain Kale, and try to help out with the countryside citizens of Naboo. From there, the RNSF tries to regroup and formulate some kind of resistance to the ongoing droid occupation. During that time, we save a vessel being attacked by the Trade Federation belonging to Borvo the Hutt, who offers to ally himself with us as repayment for saving his ship. So with added resources and allies, we launch a direct offensive on the Trade Federation to cripple their forces and rescue Naboo hostages which are being used as slaves. 
but in a twist no one could have seen coming, Borvo outright betrays us, and we have to fight off his forces along with the Trade Federation's occupying force. The first and third acts are dedicated to fighting the Trade Federation, but the second act is mostly given to fighting and defeating Borvo the Hutt and his forces, which ended up being one of the most notable parts of the story for me. They don't know who they're messing with. Gavin Sykes is in Her Majesty's Royal Service. All of this is what is happening while Padme is on Coruscant pleading to the Galactic Senate for help. When she returns to retake Theed, Sykes and the remaining RNSF forces rally behind her to essentially play out the final events of the movie, even allowing us to play the final assault on Volton Pala, the big circular droid control ship we see Anakin destroy in the movie. The penultimate level inside of Theed is arguably the most ambitious level between both this and Rogue Squadron, to be honest. It's dense and really detailed. I feel like this game even does better justice to the final battle from the movie than Starfighter did. Even though that one was way better graphically and scale-wise, this one didn't try to make our protagonist more than he was, and we hear Anakin when he comes flying out and see the ship start to blow up. It's a tighter-knit story than most of the other Star Wars games I've seen so far, but I'd be lying if I said I didn't get a kick out of getting to play the events on Naboo we didn't see in the movie between when Padme escaped Naboo and when she returned. Whereas a lot of these games take place vaguely between the events of certain movies, this one can be pinpointed so specifically within The Phantom Menace that it really feels like we're playing a genuine companion piece to the film, even so far as seeing our player character in the movie, which is awesome. Now, I really don't talk about graphics in my videos unless I'm praising them or talking about how good they are. Criticizing something like that isn't my thing, and I don't typically care how bad graphics are if I'm having fun, but I'm happy to point out if the graphics do go above and beyond. This is sort of a special instance though, because the graphics aren't just bad, they look worse than the game they're following up in some cases. Somehow, Battle for Naboo manages to look worse than Rogue Squadron in a lot of ways, despite coming two years after. There are some parts of it that look better, like the lighting and maybe the textures, the new particle effects they introduced are really cool, like rain and snow, and the draw distance is way further, which makes things feel more immersive. But the explosions, for some reason, look way worse, like a green screen preset. They looked similar in Rogue Squadron, but way less apparent for some reason. And the most unforgivable part? What the hell is this? Are you kidding me? Is this really the best they could do? I get 3D was a new technology at the time, but are you telling me they couldn't model a 3D character model for this speeder? This paper thing looks just awful. I'm not alone either, as this was a point of criticism upon the game's release, actually. I just don't believe it had to be this way. I really think if they'd wanted to, they could have modeled something here instead of using paper textures. Like, who thought this would be okay? Moving on to the gameplay, you'll see it is very similar to Rogue Squadron, so I'll tell you now, if you like Rogue Squadron or if this gameplay looks fun to you, then you'll probably like this game. It's that simple. That being said, although this game takes place exclusively on or around Naboo, don't be fooled into thinking that the environments aren't varied. Between the multiple different vehicles we have, three different biomes we get to see, and the inclusion of space battles, which were notably absent from Rogue Squadron, Battle for Naboo might actually be more varied than its predecessor. Although we mostly see the standard fair, beautiful paradise planet aesthetic of Naboo, across a few levels we do get to see snow, a swamp, and of course, space. So it's varied enough, especially when you take into account that you'll be switching between land, sea, and air vehicles across these levels. One very impressive new feature is that some levels have hangars where you can swap seamlessly between land or air vehicles during the mission which is pretty awesome, honestly. And it's a feature that pays off as they use it several times to take you straight from dogfighting in the air to a totally different style of vehicle combat. We already know the aerial gameplay is gold. I covered that in the Rogue Squadron video. So what about the new ground and water combat? Well, the ground combat is awesome. Each time I got to do it, I was thrilled and had a blast. There's really only three vehicles to choose from between two speeders and a staff, at least by default, with a very clear hierarchy of which one is better than the other, but all three of them are very fun to play with. As for the sea-based combat, I won't sugarcoat it, it sucks. Like, it's bad. The most offensive issue is that the aiming straight up doesn't work, and auto-aim can't save it. 
The default aim is like an inch too high to shoot anything in front of you, and a few inches too low to take out turrets positioned above you. It's really an awful experience. There's only one boat to control, and it doesn't even look cool to play. The whole dynamic is terrible, and it damages the experience overall. Fortunately, I think there's only two missions where you're in this thing, and only one of them where you're in it for the whole mission, so it's not too bad. There's pretty much the same number of missions as Rogue Squadron, but several of them feel way shorter, so I think I completed this game faster than when I played Rogue Squadron, but let me tell you, it's, for some strange reason, way harder. I don't know why, but they upped the difficulty or something, because about halfway through it, it gets insanely hard to avoid taking damage. So just be aware of that if you're planning to go play it. Now earlier, I said the game takes place mostly on Naboo. That's because just like Rogue Squadron, we have a few bonus levels to look at. There's three bonus levels to unlock, and there are a number of cool little secrets you can find across the levels, or cheats to try if you're inclined. The first of the levels is pretty bland, I feel. You're protecting a Republic transport as it leaves with a bunch of files from a Trade Federation base. It's not very noteworthy, I feel. The second two are where it's at. Coruscant Encounter has us flying through the high-rise streets of the city planet, chasing Darth Maul's Sith infiltrator as we attempt to shoot him down. It's pretty insane, but really fun. Makes me wonder, how have we not gotten more modern games that let us fly through the streets of Coruscant like this before now? Then, the last hidden mission is probably the coolest. We get to control Darth Maul in his Sith Infiltrator as we cut through dozens of Naboo forces, destroy farms and buildings, leaving this Naboo countryside in burning ashes, which, after spending so many levels trying to keep these things safe, is admittedly a little cathartic. All in all, some very unique and fun extras that probably made trying to get those gold and silver medals all the more worth it back in the day. Earlier on the channel, I did a video on the Starfighter games, and something a lot of you may notice is that there are some striking similarities between this and Star Wars Starfighter, but let me assure you, they're very different games. For one, I feel like the story in this one is better than in Starfighter, and that there's more to see and do, too. There were more characters in Starfighter, and there was a much stronger attempt at a real story, even taking the player away from Naboo for most of the game but it ended up just feeling strange and out of place to me, and I don't think the multiple perspective jumps to different characters helped either. In Battle for Naboo, the story may not look as pretty or have any cutscenes, but it's far more concise, equally as interesting, and we play as the same character from start to finish. Not to mention, you only ever control fighters in Starfighter, naturally. So although the two games may look similar and share the N1 Starfighter on the cover, Rest assured that they are two very different games. As mentioned before, Battle for Naboo has significantly more in common with Rogue Squadron than it does Starfighter. The music was once again handled by Rudolf Stimber, but unlike Rogue Squadron, this game really doesn't have a musical identity of its own. Nearly all of the music you'll hear is directly from the movie, although it's been rewritten into Factor 5's Musy X sound driver so it sounds more video gamey, all of the melodies are very clearly all taken directly from The Phantom Menace. Which, to be honest, fits. This game is a side story that takes place directly alongside the events of the movie, so I'm fine that it shares its identity that much closer. It's all great, of course, but I mean, it's John Williams, so stands to reason it would be. The game's reception was unfortunately quite telling. While it received mostly positive reviews, pretty much all of the criticism was aimed at the lack of innovation for gameplay, the lower quality music not holding up to other games on the market at the time, and the graphics. Though they were apparently pretty mixed on those issues from what I read, the game's PC port was significantly less appreciated, being given what amounts to a 5.5 out of 10 average when I looked. Okay, so... The question, is Battle for Naboo worth pulling and trying out for yourself? Well, overall the game has a lot to offer and a very fun package. Star Wars fan or not, this is still one of the better N64 games I've played, and the extra context for the movie's plot was just an added treat for me. So if you haven't been able to guess from that alone, the answer is a very simple yes. I wouldn't really call it like a resounding yes, but it is good and I had fun. I am comfortable saying this one is worth checking out. 
I feel like it's in the shadow of Rogue Squadron in a lot of people's minds for all kinds of reasons, but make no mistake, it's every bit as exciting and worth playing as Rogue Squadron is. Thanks for watching everyone, it's always such a pleasure to hang out and talk about these old gems here in the Retro Room. I hope you've enjoyed it, and if you have, make sure to leave a like and drop me a comment about your experience with Battle for Naboo. I always love reading all your stories when you share. And remember that members get access to early parts of my long retrospectives and other little perks like joining my Discord, so consider signing up if you're really loving the content. You can also follow me on X to keep up with my day-to-day -day if that's your thing. Anyway, thanks again for watching, and I hope to see you in the next video. But until then, that's all I got for you.